let's move to our next session. Amy, how are you doing? I'm great, thanks. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad that you are on video and, and audio. I can hear you very well. That's great. And look, something that Todd mentioned earlier in providing a perspective to about modern construction is this concept of industrialized construction. We want to thank Amy Marks for, from Autodesk from joining us today and, and bring her perspective, Autodesk perspective, as it relates to that vision. But before that, let me properly introduce you, Amy, and to put my glasses to read your bio properly. And Amy is Vice President of Industrialized Construction and Strategy and Evangelism at Autodesk. She is known around the world as the Queen of Free Fab. Uh, a lot of people probably know that. At Autodesk, she informs product strategy, thought leadership, and convergence consulting for customers incorporating industrialized construction methodologies. Prior to <clears throat> joining Autodesk, she defined the language, process, and frameworks that are adopted by companies, universities, and countries around the world, reflecting the convergence of design, make, operate type models. Notably, Amy was appointed by the Singapore government's building and construction authority as an international expert to advise its design and construction productivity roadmap. Her thought leadership and tenacity leading alongside the government and industry resulted in unprecedented change in inno and innovation catapulting Singapore to worldwide recognition in the industrialized construction space. Amy has graduated from the University of Florida and she is an alumna of the Harvard Business is cool. Without further ado, Amy, thank you for joining us. Look forward to a lot of the ideas around the vision. So I will step, stop sharing my screen and, and it's over to you. Fantastic. I'll start sharing my screen. Thank you. And here we go. We can see it. Well, yeah. buckle up because we have a lot to cover in a short amount of time. But luckily, Bridget Pru from Autodesk is going to follow up from me and she's going to show a couple of my my normal stuff so i have a little more time hopefully more than normal so here we start i'm amy marks and i'm the head of industrialized construction strategy and evangelism at autodesk also known as the queen of prefab I'm going around the world to some of the coolest factories, and I'm meeting with owners, designers, builders, and manufacturers to get a behind-the-scenes look at what goes into fabricating the future. Join me, the queen of prefab. So I didn't show that to you just because I, I have some fabulous shoes, by the way. I have to hear a lot about golf in this ecosystem and industry. So not to show you my shoes, but to tell you that there's a lot of attention around this right now. We posted up those videos that were a year old on Autodesk's YouTube site. We have over 3 million views in less than three months. 3 million views in less than three months. And many of those people, the majority of our subscribers that, that in those three months are actually coming from those video views. And so I think that's really exciting that not only are people watching, they're learning, they want to get involved in this. I actually work around the world as we just were mentioning, but I think this really applies to everybody around the world, not just in the United States. And I think you got to know that this is a global thing that's happening faster and faster than ever right now. And here's why. I would say, listen, technology is really converging and technology is converging. I always say, as you know, this is my phone. Can't quite see. There you go. This is my phone. It's my map. It's my dating app. It's my entertainment. It's everything converged into this thing that I can't live without that's in my hand all the time. Right. And we also talk about the fact that, like, you know, design, make, and operate, the processes of that are actually converging. Those silos don't necessarily exist anymore. And we're getting more and more uncomfortable with those gaps. And we see industries converging. And we see actually, you know, manufacturing, design, and construction converging. So we, we don't just talk about how I build things. We talk about how I buy things and make things and integrate things, right? And if you look at what I just clicked up above, it's, it's not just about design, make, and operate why these industries are converging. 
It's about operate, make, and design, as you just heard from Microsoft. If there's a reason you're hearing from the owner taking control of the situation. So what happens when technology and process and industries converge? Business models change. Business models have now converged. If you haven't recognized that, you're probably at risk. Let me say that again. If you haven't recognized that business models have changed in our conversion, new value propositions, new roles, new drivers, you're probably at risk. Remember that. So let's talk a little bit about change. For those of you who know me, I always show this slide. I hope it doesn't bore anybody, but I live my life by this slide. I think change only happens when people are dissatisfied first. If everything's great. If you make lots of money and you have a boat named change order, as we say, you're probably not going to change anything that you do. But that's not the case anymore. Owners that are looking for more certainty and consistency have been unhappy with what we've been able to provide, unless you're looking at advanced technologies like SPS that we just saw. It, we are looking consistently at creating operating models um, that haven't come through for them in our design and construction spaces. If you look at any of the studies around certainty and cost and schedule, even the best projects are not coming through. And so people are very unhappy. They are losing a lot. And we've seen lots of companies going in and out of business lately that were here forever. And if we're not thinking about, by the way, if you're a CEO on this call and you're not thinking about how you're gonna be wiped off the face of the earth, you're not doing your job. But then you have to have a vision for what's possible. It's not enough to be unhappy, right? Because people that are unhappy that have nowhere to go just remain unhappy. And so we have to have a vision for what's possible. And then it's not enough to have great marketing and show something, some Herculean effort that's been done. You actually have to have a first concrete step of action to take in order to get to that new vision of what's possible. And all of that has to be greater than resistance, right? Internal resistance from your own organizations, which is usually greater than even external resistance that you're going to encounter in these places. So that is the formula for change. So knowing that, let's hear from some of our customers. I'm gonna apologize in advance because MCOR does not have an E on the end of it. But other than that, check out what some of your peers are saying in the, in the space. What we're doing now, we're beginning to treat, for years we've heard, just design it, we'll figure out how to prefab it. Do whatever you want, we'll figure it out. That doesn't work. Because right. the rules, the data, the information comes in after the design is done, and then it throws us into this monster. And that's not working. It's a nightmare. And, and like we, you know, one of the things that struck me working, working in the design field was that there was, you know, especially in like a hard bid process, there's no feedback loop at all. Right. Uh, like I'm literally sitting in an office detailing something, you know, without any ability to check with the actual people who make that thing in a, in a meaningful way and collaborate with them around that information. So it's, it's, about, it's about bringing the making into the design versus sort of creating a design and hoping it can be made. Exactly. You know, like we, it's, uh, we have to kind of flip the script, I think. Okay. Right, data, data, it's all important. And to be able to utilize data and to be able to really gather that data and be able to use it individually in a manner in which we can develop this kit of parts or develop these pieces, these components, right. and be able to design those components, be able to create those components or componentize our business it makes it much easier to assemble a completed delivery in a kit of parts fashion. That's what people are saying. You've got to move. Doing. Sorry, got to move the make into design. Okay, I told you it's not enough just to have a vision. You have to have first concrete steps of action on how to get there. So I created this transformation framework, mostly for some of my customers that were very frustrated that they could see a cool vision and they didn't know how to get there, or that they were missing and lacking some of the foundational skills and tools. But all they were doing was trying to optimize from day one. That's also a mistake. That's why we have so many starts and stops and failures in our space in industrialized construction. So you've got to first understand why you're doing certain things. I always ask businesses, multi-billion dollar businesses, what does this business want to be when it grows up? What does it want to be next year or the year after that? Where did it come from? What keeps you up at night? You want to understand those outcomes and then you need a strategy on how to achieve those outcomes. And then your first steps are to first assess readiness in lean, we called it Shingo, you know, whether or not you have culture, skills, tools, technology, and processes to get there. I always like to say, like, you want to be a manufacturer, uh, you could probably afford, if you've got funding, to buy a six-axis arm robot if you were opening up your facility on day one. It doesn't mean you should buy a six-axis arm robot because you might not have the culture and the, you know, operation 
know-how and staffing and, and actually the products to feed it that would allow you to buy a six access arm robot to be successful. That robot is actually just gonna collect a lot of dust in the corner, like my treadmill does sometimes, or it's just gonna make scrap much, much faster, right? So the same thing goes for technology. You can't actually think you're gonna get somewhere connecting this data with a lot of disparate tools working on their own. You've gotta be able to make sure you can assess readiness on all of these things that you see on that foundational level, including if you're into lean manufacturing, not the same as lean construction as Todd and I, both know, but you know, you've really got to understand where you're at in your organization if you're even able, ready to get there and what is missing. After that, and don't discount that, by the way, that's really important, all that touchy-feely stuff, but not just the touchy-feely side, the architecture of that, right, of all those things, where the gaps are, you then have to assess and understand productization. What is your mindset to drive data reusability from both the physicality of products and piece parts and the productized workflows that are associated with those particular piece parts. What is the process development? What is the workflow associated with that skid or that wall panel or that generator enclosure? Whatever that thing is that one day you wanna track with you know, all the great things we just saw. That productization has been something that's really been lacking in our ecosystem. As we always say, well, buildings have to be one off every single time and how can I have standards and how can things not be different? I don't agree with any of that, by the way. I think productization is what transforms us. Once you can productize something, once your skid actually has become a product, you can put a little data backpack on it, a little data backbone, if you will, to think of things and actually digitize those products and that workflow to enable not just a workflow that you can get through, but one that can be eliminating steps and automating steps and connecting lots of different workflows that end result becomes a building. And once you have those digitized workflows, you can actually enable them in the cloud and connect them through platform thinking to lots of other people that have lots of other tools that can use that little data packet on the backpack of your skid and compute things that you couldn't compute with just the products you have in-house, but a world of products that are out there, software products and tools and technology that could actually act on that skid and do things with it and then connect that to other people and stakeholders around the world so that you could actually optimize it in that vision and see things like industrialized construction and digital twins. Think of that skid now having an IoT sensor, not just at the end result of it, but in what you just saw in the previous you know, presenter from the time in which you're buying the subcomponents of it and then assembling it in the manufacturing facility and making it, shipping it, tracking it, installing it, and then also understanding how it operates in digital twin form. And a lot of that can be enhanced capabilities can be used once you productize and connect these things. Without that, it's like trying to put your finger down on water, right? This is like putting down an artificial reef in an ocean where we can build little ecosystems around it. Because ultimately we're looking for circularity, which is not just about green buildings, it's about digital and physical reuse. I challenge every architect and engineer to judge themselves based on everything they never have to draw again. Unfortunately, we get paid to draw things, but really we should be asking ourselves, what can I draw now that I never have to draw again that I can just adjust in the future instead of starting from scratch every single time? And I'm the queen of prefab and in the front of my house, I just redid my house. I have a dumpster, a trash bin, and you know, 50% of my new bathroom is sitting there along with 100% of the one they took out. And so 40% of what's in our landfills right now is waste. And most of that is because we think this is only a process-based business. And I will tell you that I believe our ecosystem will be product-based. So we could get rid of that trash bin in the front of my house and every other job site around this world. We could have less trash, less things, less cutting, less welding on site, less work on site. That framework, if you follow it, will get you to different places. And I want to focus a little bit on that productization piece today. It's a verb on purpose, by the way. Like, just keep that in mind. And I like to think of industrialized construction as sort of like the house that Toyota built. You know, we have foundational steps. This is the house that industrialized construction built, like technology enablers and process enablers, things like IoT that I just mentioned that become more and more readily accessible as you componentize the building, as Adam Snavely said, so we can understand some data and analytics around these buildings for hopefully one day autonomous acting buildings that we understand how they're operating, not just as a building, but as a portfolio of buildings, if you own lots of buildings, to make choices in the future of our construction and operational schemes. And we want that in the cloud because that makes us actually more resilient as we've just learned over the last two years. And we only wanna use that data in the cloud from that little data backpack that I need at the moment. I don't wanna to have to download the entire building just to do some sustainability compute. 
And those process enablers like lean manufacturing, I think that are so important to the way we efficiently make things, but also building information modeling. Now, I love the building information modeling. I think three-dimensional drawings are fantastic, but only if they represent what will actually be made. And you can't do that necessarily in design software. I think the design software needs to be informed by manufacturing software. It needs to consume manufacturing data so that the eye actually becomes intelligent, not just information. And I don't say design for manufacturing and assembly anymore. I actually say data for manufacturing and assembly anymore now so that you can use things like robotics and automation as you see up in those advanced building techniques and additive manufacturing. All that data has to exist up front. We need to inform those things. We need to inform Digital Twin up front. Everything can't be like, well, we'll fill it in later as we have the info. What? We have to flip the script, as you heard some people say. Because prefabrication is sort of what happens downstream right now, this continuum. Yes, we have advanced building products and single trade assemblies, multi-trade assemblies and modules, but not the best ones we could actually make because we allow architects to stretch them, make them taller, shorter, wider, fatter, change the inputs and outputs into something that's not manufacturable sometimes. And it is something that's not manufacturable efficiently a lot of times. And so we have to again, apply that verb of productization. So this results in products one day that inform our design, not just, you know, are at the mercy of the design. And if you read the McKinsey report, which a lot of people quote, but not a lot of people have actually read, my opinion, because I only hear one statement coming out of it, like 45% of our ecosystem is going to move towards industrialized construction. Well, if you read it, they actually talk about the market dynamics changing. And once the market dynamics have been changing to more sophisticated owners and more requirements around sustainability, there are these emerging disruptions. And I'm only saying four, I think there are actually nine. But I said these four because 66% of the survey respondents thought that industrialization and digitization are gonna be the most emerging, the, the most impactful, highest impact emerging trends that exist. And then those future industry dynamics, three quarters of the respondents said that the most important thing that happens in the next one to five years is a product-based approach and industrialization. Product-based approach in the next one to five years. We're in year two of this study right now. What have you done in your business to think about productizing things? So we have a vision at Autodesk and really this vision comes in order to enable the creation of customizable, reusable manufacturing data for the built environment at scale. If you can reuse things and you can make things, we can start attaching more data to them to be reused and improved and understand more about those lead times that SPS just talked about and availability and how early do I actually need to get something there because I've done it more than once. And so we have to really enable that creation of this data that's so important because we have a problem. Uncertainty is truly, truly our enemy right now. If you don't recognize that, I, I have customers that have said for years, certainty is better than saving. You have to hear and work with those customers because those are the customers that are making the biggest changes. And design decisions right now are not informed by what can be made mostly. How do we address it today? I'll go through that in the sad, sad story of the iterative processes that are all so painful and expensive we all have to go through on day in and day out. And they have high risk and uncertainty for us. So there is an opportunity. Anytime there is a problem, there is an opportunity. And so we can connect these tools and enable new tools and new capabilities and allow processes to work at scale. I don't mean just Autodesk tools. I mean, ecosystem tools. That's really important that you hear me say that. So let's talk about how it's addressed today. This is not a fun story, but we all know that it's true. Right now, let's say somebody wants to make something. I'm gonna say, let's talk about a football stadium. I watched a really great Monday night football game this week and uh, I'm a Steelers fan just for the record. But anyway, so, there's bathrooms in those stadiums and there's a battery bathroom backup behind the walls of the stall bathrooms, right? It's an assembly that nobody really cares much about. Everyone has to go to the bathroom. We drink a lot of beer at football games, but most architects could care less of what that really looks like, the guts behind the wall of the stall bathrooms. So when they have to conceptualize a building, they click on some static Revit data, something in their desktop, uh, not in the cloud, but something that they cut and paste, placeholder allocation, some space thing, and they put it behind the bathroom wall. They then pass to the GC at some point who clicks on their static information on their desktop from some cut and paste or some database that's usually not in real time connectivity with wrong and incomplete information with estimates, not costs. That's why we call it that because it's truly an estimate who months later passes those assumptions on assumptions to his poor MEP sub that has to then figure out how to make a performance of a five stall in a two and a half amount of space with the performance requirements of a nine stall bat. What? 
he can't make, she can't make that efficiently. There's no detailed engineering, usually in some of these pieces and parts, no bill of materials, no cost, no fabrication information. And what do they do? They hand it to their fabrication manager and say, do the best you can. I don't know what else you'll do. Um, you're constrained. And they go, well, I can make a one-off. I've never done this one before because it's like standing on my head and you know speaking French at the same time and patting my tummy. But like I can kind of come up with something. They pass it back to the GC. It doesn't usually match the cost and schedule requirements. Who hands it back to the AE firm? It also doesn't meet their original intent because it couldn't. It was like making something up, right? And so that's painful. Here's what's more painful. We do that around thousands of interdependent assemblies every single day for very simple through very complex buildings. And what takes priority? You know, listen, I've been on plenty of IPD jobs, but usually what takes priority is who's gonna get paid first on what thing? We know it's about steel and long lead times and moving dirt around and things that people wanna get paid for quickly and put their orders in and write their, you know, their, 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 their contracts around, right? but that's not helping us. And by the way, if this was a true manufactured product, I'd have to add the layer of other additional subcontractors and other distributors into this mix. And that would make it exponentially worse. They call that protecting the spec. So now that I've made us all you know, into despair, I will say there is a lot of hope. So if you watched Autodesk University, again, a place where lots of learning happens, our learning, other people's learning. Andrew Anagnas on day two of it in the keynote talked about so much of this uncertainty could be addressed if we only brought manufacturing to the front of the design process. And then architects around the world shuddered. They shouldn't, but they did. So he showed an example of inventor to Revit connection with Scott Reese, and it was a one-to-one -one mapping. Remember those words. They showed something was designed in inventor with constraints and parameters. It got put into Revit and Revit made an adjustment and it fixed the original inventor file. Automated, right? That's one-to-one -one mapping. That's great, it's critical skill. We need more than that now. We need to move past that at some point. And again, future state, we need one-to-many mapping. We need one model made in manufacturing type software, ours, somebody else's, that can be consumed by Revit or AutoCAD or the design software, ours or somebody else's. So somebody can work in their design tools, make adjustments to that bridge and get 40 instances of that bridge and send it back to the manufacturer who can now manufacture those 40 bridges because you only let them change the one-to-many mapping to what could be manufactured. Simple, we let people stretch and change things all day long that can never be made. There are no controls within the design software in that, in that way. It was never intended to be used like that. And I always say, you can't make a duck into a dog. You just can't. We have to look to other tools now and other skill sets. We need manufacturing informed design, but it's not enough to have a product. And it's not one product, we just said. We have to advocate for business change. What does that mean? Look, Phil Bernstein was a thought leader. They called it thought leadership and evangelism. I like the word advocate. I like to speak out the unheard voices in the ecosystem, synthesize them, think about my thoughts, thoughts that were going into the future, and, and meld them into what the direction needs to be so that everyone gets what they need. And also, we have to support that with change in behavior. And so we have a convergence consulting group here now that Bridget's going to talk more about that is about manufacturing experience and, and consulting experience, not just on tech, but on everything that can be applied to our space. Because ultimately, we want to make sure that we can connect making design data so that architects don't have to be database managers and that craftsmen can apply technology because they don't have the luxury not to now if they want to work at any kind of scale. Because all we do for the most part is make snowflakes. And even if you're tracking that data and something cool, that data gets tracked and then it goes into the garbage because you never make that thing again. And you make something sort of like it so it's not the right data and then you track it again and it goes into the garbage or some dirty data gets to the front. We have to stop making snowflakes. Prefabrication is stuff that happens downstream. Usually the only way we get to, you know, we talked about DFMA was somebody with their mouth like me went to the front of the process and said, here's the best way I can make that thing in the space you allocated for it and I can fabricate it. That's prefabrication. Products, productization, that verb we have to do, no architect in the world, I always say, wakes up and decides they're going to design a Kohler 217 and a half horsepower generator. Why? Because it's a product. We design around products. We understand the scale of the capacities of those, and we integrate them into our design, manufacturing informed design. We do it every single day. I'm not telling you to do anything differently. It's just we need more products up front to inform that design process. And so what does that mean? And this is really the hard part, I'll tell you. You need to not only understand that you need a software to capture that in that's mechanical CAD, but you need to understand how things are made and what's scalable about them and what the rules and constraints are. And that no software is gonna tell you what that is. That comes from the makers. 
And we want to not just do them one off or repeatable. We have to define what can be made so we can manage it and then optimize those, both the physicality of those things and the workflows around them. We have to get out of this project-centric mindset. Projects are killing us. We don't get much learning on a project because it doesn't translate to lots of other things. We have to think products and programs. That's why I love the big owners. And we know that this is happening because, by the way, this is GSK showed this in public at the um, Advancing Prefab show that's coming up again in April. And we know it's happening. Not why now. It's like it is now, really. Um, and at the last show we did there, we had a lot of C-suite executives and VPs. And we said, how many of you, now that we described convergence, would say, I'm a convergence customer? 82% of the audience actually considers themselves convergence customers now. And 79% of them said they were on a productization journey. A lot of the heavy MEP building applications are moving the fastest, by the way. That makes sense, right? The complex things that are heavy MEP and complex structure. And also because they have a lot of things to build. Nobody just builds one semiconductor plant or one car manufacturing facility or what, right? It's like people always went to housing for what made sense. I don't agree. I think, yeah, heads and beds are fine. But the places that have the most to gain are the ones that have the heavy, heavy MEP applications, the highly technical stuff, right? Makers also converge. And you have to remember this. We're thinking AEC now. So we're thinking all the subcontractors and general contractors and even architects. I said it, even architects now that have fabrication facilities, even owners. Shh, don't tell anybody I said that's true. But multi-trade makers are those guys and they're the guys coming down from the manufacturing side. You have the guys consuming that data and you have the serial owners that are owning that data. And at the center core of that, they all benefit from a condensed work, uh, sorry, connected workflow that is informing design and make, right? Roberto, are you coming on? Cause I'm running out of time. Yes, I am. All right, well, give you me a couple have, more uh, minutes. Couple, couple more, more minutes. minutes. We, we have no questions. So we'll go for a couple more minutes. We need to deliver a connected workflow that productized workflow so we can improve upon it. And by the way, makers have to start defining these things so architects can discover them, hopefully in the cloud, not on their desktops anymore one day, customize them, create unique instances, and have unbelievable amounts of automated outputs in many different ways. I'll go quickly about this. The trick is you have to define what, only what's manufacturable. You can't do that in design software. It must be done in manufacturing software. And we only want the people that know how to do what they do in their own software silos still work in the tools they feel comfortable in. I always say, and I'm almost done now, Roberto, I have to advocate for change. I'm here to do that here and also to capture the voice of your customers internally. I can work internally with any group so that I can influence not just everyone on the outside, but internally as well. Bridget's gonna talk about this. I won't speak about this today, but she's gonna talk about enabling a business transformation. It's not enough for a bunch of general contractors to sit around and be like, we gotta be more like manufacturers or architects, by the way. I just sat in a big $20 billion initiative where they're talking about how they need manufacturing to move to the forefront. Who's in the room? All architects. <laughs> what? It was like creating manufacturing from scratch. I was like, you do realize like people make stuff on this planet and know how to manufacture things. Where are those people? Like, why are they not sitting in this room? Why am I pretending manufacturing is something new that we all have to figure out how to do? So again, we're here to help you on this transformation. And I always say, I'll take any questions. I love challenges. I think collaboration without conflict is just not real. So like, by the way, that, that is my presentation. I'll stop sharing. I did okay, Roberto. Wasn't too, <laughs> wasn't too over. No, 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 that's fine. You did, uh, you did great, Amy. So. Thank you so much, uh, by the way, on behalf of PPI for joining. You know, we're going to move into another section right now. And I think this section is about the journey of, you know, for industrialized construction. A lot of the ideas that you have shared with us and that vision, productization, and also, you know, some of the survey, I believe, that you show from 2020 that uh, I think was quoted McKinsey, that also brings a process perspective, right? Yes. And what, what are the implications on the process side, right? Yeah, we can, we can industrialize, but, you know, what is that perfect combination? What, what, what is the formula? So I think we're going to expand on, on the vision that you brought to us. We don't have time for questions, so I apologize for no that, but, but we have to maintain. So thank you so much for joining us today. My and, pleasure. And I'll answer any cool. questions on LinkedIn, by the way. Shoot me a note. I do it every day. Happy to do it, guys. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. So.